what racism is all about, describe the nature of the dominant form of discrimination in contemporary America, illustrate the nature of racial discourse since the 1970s, what I call colorblind racism, and lastly, outline what is to be done. So talk is good, but it's not enough. We have to develop plans of action. So I will end up talking about what we can do. Hunting for monsters is serious business. So get your garlic, your silver bullets, and your wooden stakes ready, and let's just do it. The first thing I address is conceptual, because it has monumental implications. And theory is like medicine. Tastes bad, but it's ultimately good for you. So please bear with me so until we go through the theory part. For most whites, racism is the KKK, neo-Nazis, or more recently, Clive and Bundy, the Nevada rancher who believes blacks were better off during slavery, picking cotton, or Donald Sterling, owner of the Clippers, who told his girlfriend not to pose in pictures with blacks or bring them to the games of his team. Hence, the folk definition of racism out there is the irrational belief some people have about the presumed inferiority of others. But what is wrong with interpreting these events or people as racist? The problem, as I see it, is twofold. First, by classifying overt and crass racial events as what racism is all about, we fail to understand that racism forms a social system. That is, that we all participate in racism as a system, some as beneficiaries and some of it as its victims. And we all participate of racism, whether we like it or not, or whether we're conscious of it or not. No one can say, I am beyond race, so long as you live in a racialized society, okay? It's not enough for you to say, I'm a good person, I'm beyond race, I don't know any person of color, how can I be racist, yeah? Because we are all living in this racialized society. If racism were limited to the actions, beliefs, or comments of a few obnoxious folks, racism would have been eliminated from the face of the earth a long time ago. And I know this is all heavy, the idea that whites form a social group, that they benefit, that we all participate. So in the discussion, hopefully, we can engage in these uh, deep issues. The second problem with conceiving racism as a psychological quirk or as overt behavior of some is that we miss most of the racial affairs happening before our own eyes. As I will argue soon, the bulk of racial events and behaviors nowadays are subtle, institutionalized, and apparently non-racial. Therefore, by focusing our attention on overt racial events for moral judgment and political action, we legitimate an erratic conceptualization of racism. Second, we cloud efforts to bring to the fore discussions about how race matters in the everyday life. And lastly, we help sustain the notion of America the beautiful, that is, of a country that is no longer racist because racially motivated incidents are, as we love to say in colleges and universities, isolated incidents. How many isolated incidents you need to happen again and again and again and again to know that you're dealing with a pattern, yeah? So then, what is racism? Racism is anchored around real practices and behaviors that produce positions of relative privilege for some and of subordination for others. Therefore, the crux of racism as a system is material and rational rather than psychological and irrational. This is the forest that she was talking about, yeah? we need to remove that forest in which some people in the forest get a better deal than others, yeah? Let me now talk briefly about the second matter in my talk. 
the state of contemporary discrimination in the nation. I have labeled the dominant practices responsible for racial inequality as the new racism. By this I mean the subtle and apparently beyond race character of most public racial practices. This system of racial practices, which has all but, re but replaced Jim Crow, the Jim Crow order of the past, emerged in the late 1960s. For more on this, <laughs> first commercial, see chapter four in a beautiful book. <laughs> that's right, that's right. I have a kid, I have a kid. Papi, papi, can you float me a thousand dollars? I'm like, you crazy. Yeah? <laughs> Let me give you a few specific examples of new racism practices. We all know that residential segregation was maintained in the Jim Crow era through racial terrorism, which still happens from time to time. Housing covenants, these are agreements between property owners not to sell or rent to folks of color, yeah? And by the active participation of the federal government, which among other things, certified racist lending practices such as redlining and transfers billions of dollars to the creation or to help create white suburbia. But because these practices became illegal and the normative climate of the post-civil rights era this allows the open exercise of racist behavior, one would expect residential segregation to have declined significantly. But this is not the case. We are as segregated, almost as segregated as we were 40 years ago. How can this be the case? Residential segregation remains in place today because discrimination in the housing and lending markets are still in place. Report after report, document how little we have improved in this area and how new racism practices are behind the current level of residential apartheid. For example, the authors of a recent report issued by the Civil Rights Report at Harvard titled More Than Money noted that, and I quote, affordability alone cannot explain the existing pattern of segregation and added, the main reasons for continuing segregation include steering by realtors. This is where realtors tell you, I don't see any color, but they do steer people into white neighborhoods or black neighborhoods. So if you are a black person, this is a good neighborhood for you. But a white person, this is a safe neighborhood for you, yeah? <laughs> so steering by realtors, subprime loans given disproportionately to blacks and Latinos, and a lack of action by the area cities and towns. The 206 report by the Fair Housing Center of Greater Boston indicated that their testers, testers, what they do is, because discrimination has changed, so what they do is they match pairs of black or white or white Latino, send them out repeatedly to test whether or not discrimination happens. So their testers experience discrimination 45% of the time and their black testers 50%. The report also indicated that besides steering by realtors, the exclusionary tactic most often used was providing differential information to minority applicants about the availability of housing units. All in all, whites were five to six times more likely, I repeat, five to six times more likely to be told about available units than minority applicants. The report told of one black tester who was advised that the apartments she had seen were not available until January 1st. The white tester, December 1st. Advantage white, one month. In another case, a Latino tester and a white tester emailed an agent. The white tester immediately received a response email with pictures of several apartments. The Latino tester is still waiting for a response. Is this discrimination? Well, we know it is because we did the testing. But if you go to a court of law and claim, I did not get a reply, this is racism, my goodness, you're going to be called crazy, yeah? Regarding the banking industry, the Center for Responsible Lending released a study in 2006. Mary, this is when you and I bought the house in North Carolina. 
So in 206, based, based on 177,000 loans processed in the state of North Carolina, after controlling for all sorts of factors, they found that blacks were still 29% more likely to pay a high interest rate on a fixed home, a fixed rate home loan. For young folks, you may not be aware of this, but a difference of 0.01 in a loan is a lot of money. Yeah? All this housing and banking practices exemplify new style discrimination because they are hard to detect and even harder to label racial, unless one has a smoking gun. Yeah? How can one prove, as an individual, discrimination by banks or realtor or renters? In the case of banks, we need access to all loans approved to demonstrate that race matters or have a whistleblower telling us how banks fake the racial funk. Yeah? Uh, in 2012, so you know, Wells Fargo, the largest uh, mortgage bank in the U.S., agreed to pay the Department of Justice $75 million because they were caught discriminating. Of course, you know how these things are like, we're going to pay the fine, but we, we believe we didn't do anything. Yeah, that's why you pay $75 million, yeah? Time does not allow me to go further, but similar practices have been documented in other venues and areas of life. Accordingly, given the character of contemporary discrimination, we, people of color, must bring along a white friend to go shopping, buy a car, get a loan, rent an apartment, buy a house, drive a car, walk in the streets, or, well, to do almost anything in America to prove discrimination. Okay, so many of you have seen the YouTube video, but I'm going to do it. So, I happen to be a black Puerto Rican, yeah? So I have two strikes. Dark looking person with, a, with an accent from Western Pennsylvania, yeah? <laughs> so I navigate life as a dark ontology, enduring the same things that happen to blacks and Latinos in the US. And now that I'm a professor at Duke University, I think I'm somebody, yeah? <laughs> so I tried to go to these fancy stores like Nordstrom, but apparently my money is not green enough to buy in Nordstrom. So when I go, I'm ignored or I'm followed in a clever way or I'm attacked by excessive politeness. <laughs> May I help you? I'm just looking. May I help you? Still looking, may I help you? Just looking. And I was discussing this story with uh, her before, and she told me ha uh, horrific stories about discrimination here in Tacoma, one particular case that I think you need to talk to a lawyer, yeah? Where she was in a, trying something, and they opened the curtain, thinking that she was stealing stuff, yeah? Um, so we need to begin fighting back ultimately collectively, but also individually. So in my case, I go by the rule of two. First time you do the may I help you, I will be very polite and tell you just looking. Second time I'm like, yes, I'm trying to steal this fancy coat. And I was wondering if you would. And I know it's discrimination because the response from the person is like, I didn't mean it like that. I'm like, yes, you did. If you didn't, your response should have been like, huh? What are you talking about? Yeah? Okay. Let me now move on to the third leg of my talk, the character of the dominant racial discourse in the USA. I will delve a bit more on this matter because I believe it is fundamental for understanding how race matters nowadays. I have addressed this subject in my book, Racism Without Races, where I argue that the nasty, in-your-face discourse of the past has been, for the most part, replaced by a more civilized or seemingly civilized racism that I label colorblind racism. By this, I mean the new dominant ideology anchored on the abstract extension of the principles of liberalism to race matters 
which furnishes apparently non-racial explanations for all sorts of race-related matters. <laughs> okay, I, that wasn't too subliminal, yeah? <laughs> but I told you, black and Puerto Rican, I, I had to strike, so I had to be quick, okay. <laughs> the central frames of this ideology are minimization of racism, cultural racism, naturalization, and abstract liberalism. For type sex, I will illustrate only one of them, abstract liberalism. Actually, two of them, that and cultural racism. Abstract liberalism. Yes. Yes. No, you will not treat our compassion to children. I will not let you. Okay. They need help. That would be good. And I, I was born in the U.S., so I could be the next president. I'd probably do better than Obama which unfortunately is not too hard. So abstract liberalism frames race-related issues in the language of liberalism, and whites can appear reasonable, even moral, while opposing all practical approaches to deal with de facto racial inequality. For example, Jim, a 30-year-old computer software salesperson from a privileged background, explains his opposition to affirmative action in the following manner. I think it's unfair top to bottom on everybody and the whole process. It often, you know, discrimination itself is a bad word, right? But you discriminate every day. You want to buy a beer at the store and there are six kinds of beers you can get from natural light to some others, right? And you look at the price and you look at the kind of beer and you, it's a choice. And a lot of that you have laid out in front of you. Which one you get? Now, should the government sponsor some Adams and make it cheaper than natural light because it's brewed by someone in Boston? That doesn't make much sense, right? Why would we want that or make some Adams eight times as expensive because we want people to buy natural light? This is a good illustration of how we talk about race, yeah? Because in that particular statement, there doesn't seem to be anything problematic. Some of you may still be pondering, what is problematic? If you're pondering, that's what I'm hearing. Since Jim assumes hiring decisions are like market choices, choosing between competing bar, uh, brands of beer, he embraces a laissez-faire position on hiring, hire the best qualified person. The problem with this view, which is a view shared by most whites, is that discrimination in the labor market is alive and well and affects about 50% of job applicants. We actually have now research by Diva Pager, now at Harvard, where she fabricates resumes, same resume, okay? And then changes the name of the person. And names in America are also racialized, yeah? They're not perfect, but they're racialized, yeah? So if your name is Tyrone, you're going to assume that Tyrone is black. John could be black or white, but you probably would say John, probably white, yeah? So the finding is same resume, different names. You expect, if we're a colorblind nation, that both of them would get what? Equal, equal calls. Guess what? Tyrone doesn't get no love, yeah? <laughs> so she decided to go one step further. And add, she added a criminal record to the white applicant, thinking that that would do what? Limit the likelihood of this person getting a call back. Guess what was the finding? Still, this person got an advantage by 17%. That tells you the significance of race in America where an employer prefers to have a person with a criminal background. Mind you, I happen to believe we need to give second and third chances to people incarcerated by the prison industrial complex. Uh, complex. I actually believe that we need to abolish the prison industrial complex, but that is besides the point, yeah? 
My point here is the significance of race can be tested when you prefer to hire a person with a criminal record, yeah? Or the things being equal. Okay. Furthermore, although Jim believes, as do most wise, that jobs in America are awarded in meritocratic fashion, we in the social sciences know that as many as 80 to 85% of jobs are obtained through informal networks. That doesn't mean young folks do as best as you can in college, but also network. So if someone's last name is Rockefeller, he says, what's up, Rockefeller? <laughs> Let, let's eat some Rockefeller oysters. Love them, yeah? Therefore, by upholding a strict laissez-faire position on hiring while ignoring the significant impact of discrimination in the labor market, Jim can safely voice his opposition to affirmative action in a seemingly race-neutral way, in a colorblind fashion. The essence of the cultural racism frame, as William Ryan pointed out a long time ago, is blaming the victims, arguing that minorities' position in America is the product of their lack of effort, loose family organization, and or inappropriate values. An example of, of how whites use this frame is Kim, a student at Miss Western University, who when asked, many whites explain the status of blacks in this country as a result of blacks lacking motivation, not having the proper work ethic, or being lazy. What do you think? And Kim said, yeah, I totally agree with that. I don't think, you know, they're all like that because President Obama is different, but, oh, that's not there, yeah. <laughs> they're all like that, but, I mean, by the way, for young folks, progressive whites, etc., avoid doing this sort of trying to make the exceptional black person, yeah? Sometimes you do it without knowing, yeah? And it's extremely insulting to us, yeah? Thinking that, you know, you are not like the other ones, yeah? And like, yeah, I am the other ones. I am the 99 percent, yeah? Okay, so what I mean is just that if it wasn't that way, why would there be so many blacks living in the projects? You know, why would there be so many poor blacks? If they work hard, they co could make it just as high as anyone else could. You know, I just think that, you know, they're raised that way and they see their parents, are, so they assume that's the way it should be and they just follow the roles their parents had for them and don't go anywhere. Although not all whites were as explicit as this student, most subscribe to this belief, whether it is this nasty, most direct version, or in a compassionate, conservative manner. And we have learned a lot about compassionate conservatism and how it ends up putting us in a corner. Now, ideologies are not just about ideas, opinions, and views. They are also about style, about the verbal strategies we use to manufacture racial statements in public in a period where the norms of what can be said in public about race, particularly in company, have changed. We all know that, yeah? In the book, I uncover five major stylistic components of color blindness, namely semantic moves, projection, diminutives, avoidance of racist talk, and rhetorical incoherence. Again, for time's sakes, I will give you one, ex one semantic move and one example of rhetorical incoherence. So what are these semantic moves? That's a fancy term, and when I give you an example, you'll be like, yep. I'm not a racist bot. <laughs> After the bot, they go crazy, yeah? <laughs> or, some of my best friends are black. I don't know their names, but I know they are some of my best friends, yeah? <laughs> and these phrases allow whites to express their racial views in a coded, somewhat safe way because they can always go back to the safety of the disclaimer. I told you I'm not a racist. Don't call me racist, yeah? However, I'm talking about an ideology, and ideologies are always in production. They are never finished products, yeah? So, for example, if I were to do the project Again, I think that a new move out there would be something like, I voted for Obama, so. <laughs> so anyway, 
this one, the, I'm not a racist, but, and some of my best friends are black, those are still out there, but they are less efficient. So new moves are in the making. And one that I discovered was um, an, a move call, that I call yes and no. Yes and no, where respondents seemingly take all sides on a particular issue at hand. An example of how they use this move is Sandra, a retail person in her 40s, who answered the question, are you for or against affirmative action in the following apparently cryptical manner? Yes and no. I feel someone should be able to have something, education, job, whatever, because they have earned it. They deserve it. They have the ability to do it. You don't want to put a six-year-old as a rocket scientist. They don't have the ability. It doesn't matter if the kid's black or white. So Sandra's yes and no on affirmative action clearly is a no, and it's a very strong no because she finds absolutely no reason to defend affirmative action. But she's in a, if she were in a verbal discussion with someone else, she can tell you, didn't I tell you that I'm confused and ambivalent? Yes and no, I'm like, yeah, you said that, but you ended up saying nothing to support affirmative action. So you, yes and no means no. <laughs> Rhetorical incoherence refers to people becoming incomprehensible when addressing racially sensitive subjects. A good example of how this works is Ray, a student at Midwestern University who was extremely articulate throughout the interview. So it's important for you to realize we have the entire transcript of his responses. So this subject was extremely articulate. So he wasn't a, a subject that would be like, I mean, I mean, I don't know. You know what you mean? And no, he was extremely articulate until we asked him the following question. Have you ever been attracted to a person of color? So we social scientists assume that we can control how people interpret our questions. And we do a pretty good job at uh, explaining 75% of the variants out there. But some people have their own peculiar ways of reading the data, yeah? And the, even the questions we frame. So in this case, even though the question was open, people of color includes presumably all different folks, Latinos, Asians, etc., Native Americans, etc. Uh, actually, one respondent said, do Italians count? Yeah? <laughs> Which tells you about the, how the white community is also internally stratified, yeah? But for this person, person of color meant black woman. So this was his reaction. Mm, so to answer that question, no. But I would not me, I mean, I would not ever preclude a black woman from being my girlfriend on the basis that she was black. You know, I mean, you know what I mean? If you are looking about it from, you know, the standpoint of just attraction, I mean, I think that, you know, I think, you know, I think, you know, all women are, I mean, all women have a sort of different type of beauty, if you will. And I think that, you know, for black women is somewhat different than white women. But I don't think it's, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's nothing that would ever stop me from like, I mean, I don't know, I mean, I don't if that's, I mean, that's just sort of be my impression. I mean, it's not like I would ever say, no, I'll never have a black girlfriend. But it just seems to me like I'm not attracted to black women as I am to white women for whatever reason. It's not about prejudice, it's just sort of like, you know, whatever. Just sort of the way, way like I see white women as compared to black women, you know? So I don't think I need to explain this particular case, yeah? The last component of colorblind racism is racial stories. The gentleness.
Okay. We're going to go through this. That's part of life. We all have uh, to deal with life. So the last component part of colorblind racism is these racial stories, yeah? And there are two types of racial stories. Storylines and testimonies. And I will provide one example of each. Storylines or socially shared tales that are fable-like and incorporate a common scheme and wording. <laughs> it's hard, no? <laughs> it's hard, but I have to keep it together, yeah? So these storylines are fable-like because they're often based on impersonal, generic arguments with little narrative comments. And when I give you examples, you all tell me, I have heard these storylines. The past is the past. I didn't own any slaves. If Jews, Italians, and Irish made it, how come blacks have not? And lastly, I did not get a job or got admitted to the University of Piet Sound because of a black man, yeah? Have you heard those? Okay, an example of how whites use these storylines is Roland, an electrical engineer in his 40s, who combined the storylines of the past is the past with the I didn't own any slaves to oppose the idea of reparations. And please, for the discussion, ignore, ignore that the person is opposing reparations. The important thing is how the person used these storylines to explain his position. I think they have gotten enough. I don't think that we need to pay them anything, or I think as long as they are afforded opportunities and avail themselves to the opportunities like everybody else. I, I don't know why we should give them any reparation for something that happened, you know. I can't, I can't help what happened in the 1400s, the 1500s, or the 1600s. This person needs a lot of history, no? <laughs> when the blacks were brought over here and put into slavery, I mean, I had no control over that, neither did you. I race match the interviews, so whites with whites, black with blacks. So he's talking to the white interviewer as, you and I have nothing to do with this, yeah? So I don't think we should do anything as far as reparations are concerned. Of interest here is that although the question dealt with the effects of past and contemporary discrimination, Roland, like most whites, translated the issue to a slavery era as if racism were something in our remote past. So even if you disagree with my argument about from the 1960s onward we have a new regime, we need to help educate white America about what happened after slavery, and we have 100 years of apartheid, okay? So what are testimonies? These are accounts where the narrator is a central participant in the story or is close to the characters in the story. They are very important in the colorblind drama as almost every respondent interjected one or more in their answers. And they're also important because they allow whites to vent animosity towards minorities as they have the aura, I mean these testimonies, of personal knowledge and authenticity. The following is an example of what I label a negative testimony of interaction. And the person is Bill, a retired school teacher who narrated this testimony to explain why he thinks blacks and whites are different. After pointing out that blacks seem to be, and I quote him, very religious people, and that they bought a church in his neighborhood, he claimed they forced a restaurant out of business and explained the situation as follows. They like to eat. They pile their dishes loaded with the stuff. And I actually didn't see it, but I saw one lady come in with a full plate of chicken. I didn't pay much attention, but the next thing I know, they are leaving. Now, I know she didn't eat all that chicken. She probably put it in her purse and walked out with it. Lot of them are doing that. How can they make any money? And seeing that they're all heavy people, it seems like they do a lot of eating. So I don't know what to say about something like that. Okay, so this was an older respondent. 
most likely raised during the Jim Crow period, interviewed at the height of colorblind racism. So he's trying to move on with times, not too successfully, yeah? <laughs> but the point remains that he used this testimony to validate his belief that blacks like to eat, are cheap, and are unlike and steal. Okay, let me now conclude by suggesting a strategy to knock out Freddy Krueger. But I begin by admitting the difficulty of the project at hand. Freddy is powerful, yeah? How many times you think you have killed him and he comes back? <laughs> if racism is systemic and has a material foundation, that is, whites benefit from it, killing Freddy will be very hard as many of us in America are cool with this monster or believe that he doesn't exist. But be that as it may, I believe that we as educators have a serious job to do. First, we must teach our students and anyone who will listen about the true nature of racism. We must teach them that racism is not about good and bad people, but about an institutional racial order that benefits some at the detriment of others. We must educate to politicize working class white folks so that they realize that the crumbs they get, and they do get something, crumbs, yeah, from racism are nothing compared to what we can get if we work collectively for a more just society. Second, we must stop teaching the nonsense that to combat racism, we must preach tolerance, teach folks to be good people, or organize beer summits. Can you think about that beer summit? Americans consume more beer than probably any country in the world. If the problem of racism could be eliminated by drinking beer, it should have been eliminated a long time ago, no? Okay, so if racism is structural, the job at hand is undoing the multiple practices, mechanisms, institutions, and behaviors that produce and reproduce white privilege. All be talking to one another and being nice and tolerant is all good, so please understand me. I'm not saying that I want you to be intolerant, yeah? Or being, not being a good, pe good people, yeah? What I'm saying is none of these things will change the basics of the racial order. For that to happen, we need a serious social transformation. Third, I believe that traditional organizations, and now I'm going to get in trouble, I believe that traditional organizations, such as the NAACP, LULAC, and others, are still anchored and on a dated civil rights Jim Crow agenda. This limits their effectiveness and the scope of their work. If we have what I call today the new racism in place, with practices that are of the now you see it, now you don't type, traditional groups will not tackle this new kind of discrimination as they are ill-equipped to conceive these practices as racial and to appreciate their import. Although this new racial order may kill us softly, killing me softly, eh? when we are dead, it does not matter if we were killed in a nice way. Fourth, related to the new racism is my discussion on colorblind racism. The new ra racial discourse out there, and we all know this, the new discourse out there is subtle and seemingly non-racial, but we must work hard to disentangle the meaning of I'm not a racist, but, or I'm all for equality, which is why I oppose affirmative action, yeah? The new race talk is slippery, but it is arguably more effective in preserving the racial status quo. <laughs> Lastly, I want to end by directly outlining a plan of action for you as educators 
you are in a key position in America to help us kill Fre Freddy. First, you must appreciate the centrality of social movements in fighting racism. As I stated rather than teaching your students to be good, you must engage them to recognize its socio-structural nature and help them to get to the point where they appreciate the urgent need to get somewhat away from electoral politics and more into organizing people for social change. Yep, that's what we need. Second, you live in communities and must work there too. Your educational job should not end in schools and colleges as you can influence people in your neighborhoods, churches, and social clubs. The struggle for racial justice demands that you care about race 24 seven, period. One caveat, I want you to care about race 24 seven, but please do not engage on race work 24 seven because you will go crazy, okay? Some, take a vacation from, <laughs> from, from you know, every, every now and then. Third, for those of us in colleges and universities, the task at hand is to work to transform these places from HWCUs, historically white colleges and universities, into, and we need to begin calling them HWCUs, yeah? So that they own to their history, curriculum, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, yeah? So we need to work to transform them into truly multicultural institutions. This is a large task, but we must begin by pointing out the obvious. Our colleges claim diversity, but this is just a ruse, for the most part, to hide the plain fact that they are white-led and white-oriented institutions of higher learning. <laughs> Lastly, we collectively must make sure that we engage in public education and public work on race. We must educate people, but we must educate ourselves too, as Paulo Freire urged us to do. So today I was educated. We must join progressives, organizations, promoting racial and social justice, and use our unique talents to help them as best as we can. Nothing I have said in this concluding section is easy to do. And I know some of you may be skeptical. But the struggle for social and racial justice in America has always been hard. In 1859, John Brown died believing that abolitionists were, and I quote him, all talk. And as he said, what we need is action, action. He used the word action twice. What we need is action, action. And just a few years after his death, the Civil War began and slavery was abolished. Today, white men and women of good faith should join their minority brothers and sisters in the new struggle for racial justice. The time for theoretical progressiveness is over. It is time for all of us to recommit to the struggle. It is time for social action. We all must appreciate the brilliant and succinct truth spoken by black abolitionist Frederick Douglass, who more than 100 years ago said, power consists nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bonilla Silva, for that inspiring and insightful uh, talk about the structure of racism in our society, in our communities, and how we can begin to address it. We have time now for a discussion. 
for questions from the audience. We have a microphone in the center of the auditorium. If I could ask audience members to please come to the center, line up, and we'll, uh, Professor Benia Silva will take your questions. Let's do it. <laughs> I think we're, we're ready. Uh, I am with one of those obsolete organizations that you, you mentioned, uh, the NAACP. <laughs> and I didn't take it as an insult, because I realized that we need to do a lot of things. We need to really inform ourselves, and we need to inform our communities. I do take exception with the idea that these organizations have no place and they can't do anything. What I'm asking is, given your suggestions, and I really endorse them, I'm trying to do as much as I can to make sure that we do those things, what would you do to transform the NAACP? To transform the NAACP? Great question. <clears throat> So I, we live half an hour from Raleigh, where the NAACP in Raleigh, led by Reverend Barber, is, I think, beginning a process of change, where the NAACP is going back to the roots of social action, yeah? So for too long, the NAACP has been relatively quiet, yeah? So think about the NAACP chapter in, where the owners of the Clippers, remember? And they were getting money from this guy and giving him awards, yeah? So for too long, it has been bureaucratized. And I think it has to go back to the roots. So that's number one, going back to the roots of social movement activity, of engaging with the youth, yeah? And the NAACP, and respectfully, is a sort of a middle-class black organization. So if it's going to represent black folks, most of whom are poor and working class, it has to get a big time injection of working class consciousness. It has to begin addressing the fundamental concerns of the black masses. And the needs of the black masses are somewhat different from the needs of the black elite. So those are two or three things that I think can happen. Uh, what will be the name of the organization? Will it continue being the NAACP? I honestly don't care much for the name of the organization. So for me, it's more important that we produce an effective organization to fight back, yeah? Call it NAACP, call it the new NAACP, call it whatever. And lastly, so, so you are relatively young. I think that we need younger <laughs> folks. The new organization will have to get the impact of the hip hop generation that we in the NAACP that we, in many of the traditional organizations, remember what we did 30 years ago when we, first time we heard rap music. We criticize it. We call it all kinds of names, yeah? And now we have to realize that that music and that movement, the hip hop generation, like our generation, and we're parents telling us, your music is bad. Their music is their thing. And it has bad things, but it has great things too. And it has to be their music, their poetry, their philosophy will have to be central to the new social movements. It will not be we shall overcome. It will be whatever new music, whatever new style this new generation has. Thank you. Hello. Um, first, I'd like to thank you for your work. I really appreciate it. Um, my question is about uh, one of the first things you mentioned um, about teaching that race, racism is structural and systematic. Um, my question is, how do we go about doing that when, to me, doing so then allows the individuals within those institutions and structures and systems to be exonerated because then they blame it on the structure and not the practices that they themselves um, undertake? That's tricky, no? So those of us who are in the classroom, the first element is, let's be honest, most people don't want to believe in a structural definition of racism, yeah? So whenever you, you talk about structural racism, they tell you, are you calling me a racist? 
I'm like, did you hear what I said? It's a collective problem, yeah? Now, the second issue, as she clearly suggests, is that then some folks can say, because it's structural, I have no part on it. And that's what I kept saying. If you notice my delivery today, I keep saying we all participate. Some as victims, some as beneficiaries. I also added the second component. We participate whether we are conscious of it or not, or that we like it. So when I teach my classes, I tell the students, okay, thought experiment. Imagine that from tomorrow onward, all of you white students in my class, and I teach at Duke, so most of the students are white, <laughs> um, begin life saying, I'm not white. I refuse whiteness. From now on, I'm just a human being, like any other out there. Is that a radical position to do? And they are like, well, I'm like, honestly, racism is this external imposed things that happen to you in the streets, in banks, in labor markets. So you claiming that you are no longer white means nothing in the streets, in the mean streets of America. So therefore, you still get the benefits of whiteness, whether you like it or not. And sometimes you can get the benefits without even being aware of it, yeah? So you may get that promotion. You may be able to go and walk safely in a campus at night, whereas some of us, like as I'm a professor at Duke, I don't go at my campus. I don't go to my campus at night because I got sick and tired of the campus police. Okay, who are you? And Dr. Professor Bonilla Silva. What? Uh, okay, Professor Bonilla Silva. Well, uh, I need to see five forms of ID. <laughs> they do like they, what they did to Gates in his own house, where they asked him for two, three forms of ID. Yeah? So racial profiling happens in campuses across the nation. Yeah? And in Duke, in Texas a and and in Michigan, it happened to me. So I have done this sort of uh, self-exclusion. Yeah? Because at the same time, I want to live a long life, and I don't want to, be, to die of all this stress, racialized stress, yeah? But, but the question still remains, how do you deal with particularly university settings where then people say, yeah, I hear you, but this is so big, we really cannot do anything. So you also have to bring racism at the local level, yeah? So although you talk about at the macro level as a racial order, race and racism also operate within organizations and institutions. That's what I call these places HWCUs. And I have a whole argument about why are they W, yeah? Why are they white institutions? Not only they have a demography, a history, traditions, curriculum, etc. So after you do that, you do the racial analysis of the organization, then you force them to say, and you have to deal here to redistribute power. And if they still go, let me give you the last a line of attack. If they tell you, well, I hear you, but since racism is national, nothing will be accomplished until you deal with racism at the larger <laughs> level. In a university setting, that doesn't fly because we are special organizations. We are paid to think hard, to produce knowledge, and presumably we are the repositories of whatever is good in society. Therefore, we can and we should do better than what is out there. So the argument that we cannot do anything until society changes is nonsense. We can be central in the process of change in our society. Hi. Hi. Um, my name is Jean-Marie, and I'm a student here at UPS. And thank you so much for coming today. It was a great talk. Um, my question is, Considering the fact that white people are projected to be the minority in America in the coming decades, what does this mean for new racism? Well, that is a demographic prediction. And because race is a construction, we cannot assume that the people we call today minority will be the same in 40 years, yeah? So in other work, so bring me again, <laughs> in other work, I claim that the future of race stratification in the U.S. Is, is going to be like race stratification in Latin America and the Caribbean, where rather than having white, non-whites, a lot of the people we call today minorities are going to become either whites, so we already have some in the Latino community, etc., in the process of becoming white, as well as an in-between group that I call honorary whites. Yeah? So if we become this more complex system, 
with three spaces, white, honorary white, and a group at the bottom called the collective black, combined with a pigmentocratic logic, meaning that some people within group can feel, I'm better than you because mi pelito, que lindo, yeah. I have <laughs> softer hair, you know, and we Puerto Ricans, we blacks, we fight a lot about hair. Hair politics is central, yeah. And in Puerto Rico, we also have nose politics, lip politics, eye color. So as a kid, had I had green eyes, ooh, ojito verdes, you know, I would have been so happy because Puerto Rico is also a racialized society. And we have this no notion that whatever is quite like is better, yeah? So anyway, so the assumption that things are going to be totally different in the future where minorities are ma a majority is, in my view, problematic because it's, uh, it's based on the assumption that the people we today call minorities are going to be the same down the road. So if we become Latin, and, and now the conclusion on this, if we become Latin America-like, and some of you may be like tempted to believe, that is great, yeah? Because in Latin America, sabor, and we're all happy, <laughs> untrue. Puerto Rico, Cuba, Colombia, Venezuela, etc., have deeper racial formations. And they are deeper because remember, they were longer in the race game than we have been. They have been a hundred years deeper, yeah? So the game that they have developed is more effective in maintaining white supremacy. Because these are countries where you cannot even mention race, yeah? Which is what is slowly happening in the U.S., no? What will happen to the U.S. if the Census Bureau decides, as every now and then people suggest, to stop gathering racial data because racial data supposedly racializes the population. Then we become Puerto Rico, a country where we stop getting racial data for 50 years. And you know what happened after 50 years of not gathering data? We reintroduced the question in 2000. You know what proportion of Puerto Ricans claim to be white? 84%. We are whiter than the U.S. <laughs> Except that when you guys go to Puerto Rico, you are like, I don't see that's 84% white, but anyway. Next. Um, I had a question. I live in Seattle, and this was a question about gentrification because currently South and Central Seattle is undergoing gentrification, and it was a question about white privilege. If white people feel like the, where they want to live is the, a desire and a natural right, how do we challenge them and say that that's an act of privilege to totally regentify an entire neighborhood or section of a city? Yeah, yeah. So this is not Seattle. This is the nation, yeah? So after whites moved in the 60s and 70s from the cities to the sub suburbs, again, assisted by the federal government, which created all these roads to access white suburbs, yeah? So after years of living in these uh, white bubbles and eating, uh, what is the name of that nasty Italian restaurant, maybe? All these restaurants that I, the suburbs have the same nasty restaurants. Mary, Olive Garden, yeah? So after, <laughs> come on folks, I know some of you like it. So after years of enduring Olive Garden torture, yeah? Younger middle class folks, I said, enough is enough of Olive Garden. I want to taste culture. The assumption is that white folks don't have culture. Erratic view, but that's the way that they talk, yeah? I want to taste culture. So I want to go back into the city, yeah? But in order for them to move back into the city, they have to remove many of us, yeah? So-called urban renewal, or the way it was to call in the 50s, Negro removal, yeah? And now Negro and brown people removal, yeah? So whether it's in Chicago or Seattle or other places, this is what is happening. And we, need, we have to call it for what it is, yeah? Because they are not moving into the city to integrate themselves, yeah? They're moving, and they, another example of this is the creation of condo, yeah, condos, yeah? So you go to Houston and all these places, Miami, they have all these condo, condominiums, and they literally can live in the city without interacting with us, except a second, in a subordinate position, yeah? They interact with us when they go to the, to the restaurant, and we are their servers, yeah? but they don't interact with us in supermarkets or any other place because they have this 
double life. The life, the white life, and the culture life, yeah, at night, where they control and they decide. So we need to begin them fighting that uh, uh, return to the city because it's a racialized return. It's not a move back into the city to live an integrated life. It's a move out of avoiding Olive Garden. Yeah? <laughs> Next. I want to thank you for your, your poise and, and for the work that you have really articulated for us. This was a very meaty talk for, for me and I think for many people here. I wanted to ask you to reflect on another potential form of structural racism, which I think of as the white appropriation of public spaces. And I wanted to give you, I think that that dynamic may have been in play a little bit earlier uh, today in your talk. And I also want to give one more example. Um, I walk with a dear friend of, of color at the Nature Center, beautiful nature path. And we have noticed that the cross-country team, all white, that run through that center have claimed the entire path, the bridge. Uh, it's very hard to negotiate and sometimes feels dangerous as they um, kind of wait for us to walk, move away from the path so that they can run through as if it was their path. So I'm wondering if you might um, have some thoughts about white appropriation of public spaces. Yes, uh, excellent question. And I have been thinking about this for some time. So think about the national parks in the U.S., yeah? And when I work at Texas A&M, uh, one of the directors of the national parks came to suggest a project for, to us. Basically, why is it that we, folks of color, underutilize the national parks in the nation, yeah? And the answer is simple. I'm going to go to Wyoming or places like that because I'm going to feel unsafe, yeah? So those spaces have been racialized as white spaces, yeah? So if you really, and so I have been like talking to students about how to tabulate this. We tend to be concentrated in urban areas, yeah? So if you go state by state, what parts of the state we truly, I'm talking we people of color, truly utilize? We probably end up using less than 20% of the space in the nation. And some of it is fear, yeah? So I'm not going to go to a place where I feel the so-called boonies, yeah? I'm not going to go to the boonies because they tend to kill people like me. When I was in, in grad school, a white friend invited me to go hunting, deer hunting. And I told him, no. First, out of style, I am not going to dress in orange. More importantly, it's in the boonies. And you guys begin drinking beer, <laughs> and you are not likely to get the deer, but all of a sudden you get ideas, and you are like, this guy is dark, he's like a deer. Run, yeah? <laughs> so therefore, so there is space for us to think about systematically, yeah? A theory of race and space, and a theory and an explanation of why he said that, I think, we don't use 80% of the, of the territory in the nation, yeah? So I feel all these folks going on vacation in the summer. And I'm going to go to, you know, whatever place. Again, the boonies. And most of us folks of color don't do it. And I think it's in part because of the fear, yeah, of what might happen to us in some spaces. There is also the aggressive policing of space, yeah? This is my space. You are not supposed to be in this part of the beach or this part of the neighborhood. By the way, it's not just parks. It's also, like in Chicago, I was always a concern. My sister lived in Chicago for like uh, five, six years. And she seldom went downtown. And I thought it was a class-based issue, meaning she didn't have money to, to buy stuff there. But it's a public space, and actually it's a place that you can hang out, and for relatively little money, if you don't go and buy anything, you can relax on a Saturday or a Sunday. And I realized that the reason why she didn't go is because after you experience some discrimination in stores, or the police harasses you, then you so-called self-segregate, yeah? The so-called phenomenon of self-segregation is a phenomenon based on discrimination. If you want to know why many black students sit on the so-called black table, look at the white tables around them, yeah? Hello? If you talk about black tables, talk about the white tables, yeah? And I know this doesn't compute for some people, like white tables, yeah, they're white tables, yeah? When you are in an HWCU, you come, the onus of integration in a space for an organization is for the powerful actors. This is not just about race, it's about gender, yeah? If it's an organization that is mostly 
uh, led by men. Men have the honors of making sure that when women are integrated, they, are, they feel safe, they, 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 they have equality, and they have safety. Yeah? So, so similarly in terms of race, when we were, we're not integrated, we cohabitate in these spaces. Yeah? So in this cohabitation that we're doing, at least at this stage, the cohabitation is not that good. So we end up sort of finding our spots to hang out because we don't feel totally safe. In the future, when we remove race as a category of oppression, then we're going to be all randomly assigned. Like in this audience, I see people of all colors around. This is beautiful. But let's be honest. I wish we were the real America, but we're not, yeah? This is the way America should be, but it's not the, the way America is. Thank you, Doc. Thank you. I am not laughing. And I know you are not laughing too. But we have to have the humor to cope. When you spoke about your background, you threw in another equation. You were born in America, and then you went outside America. And you said things that make me feel, wow, I'm not that crazy at all. <laughs> because a lot of people think I'm crazy. One of the important things you said about America is, America puts itself up as the leader and say, all brains are welcome, regardless of your skin color. The beauty about us, you are like a foreigner in America now because mm -hmm. you grew up outside America, but you can be president because you were born here. Those of us who live in different countries, it's like we belong everywhere and nowhere, and we can be objective. When I came to America, what I was excited about is learning about the forefathers who came disgruntled from outside America and decided what they want to make America. And now the hostility against foreigners, like I said, it took me more than 30 years to read the Willie Lynch papers. And the part that bothers me is, I thought they only addressed black people here but when he said, do not teach the foreigners the language, because the moment they acquire the language, they are going to start asking questions and want the rights of citizenship. The question now is, what about those of us who came, we already acquired the language? How are you going to treat us or give us room to participate? When I listen to you, I say, good. It's he was born in America, he will be listened to. And what you were saying, I'm also glad what you said about what happened in the Latin America, because at least they don't claim to be democratic. When America tries to explore or export all these ideas, you don't have the three arms of government like in America to deal with it. And people don't really want to deal with racism because those who are in power enjoy the power. And the good thing about the powerful now, it's not the color of the skin. The moment they got to be in power like the oppressors, the whites, they become white too. And they are not even aware of it. And I made a mistake leaving education because that was where I belong. Because the young mind, when that young lady stood there and sang about love, if we can have unconditional love, there will be no racism. But because human beings are selfish and we always want the best for ourselves, we can't. And if we look at the economics of racism how many books are published mm. I'm just glad that you make me normal 
the question is, who is worse, you or me? Because you grew up south there, but you were born here. I came and I see and I was excited, but they don't want to hear it. Shut up. Thank you. Okay. A quick comment on, on her comment. So, uh, we are a very hypocritical nation, yeah? Because we are now trying to police boundaries and have a strong immigration policy, yeah? What if Native Americans had a strong immigration policy <laughs> back in the day? So, a, a lot of the borders that we have were borders we created, yes? Yeah? So think about the, we moving to the West and killing Indians, committing genocide, and liberating cultures and peoples, yeah? Or we took half of what used to be Mexico is today U.S. A third of the U.S. used to belong to Mexico a century ago. So, so we need to relax on that and, and hopefully think about a democratic immigration policies and also thinking about the wealth system in, without borders, yeah? So nations are disconst... Anyway, this is a deep question, yeah? So I'm not saying that we need necessarily to, to eliminate the nation state, but I think we need to begin thinking anew these boundaries because ultimately we all, you know, we're all one people, yeah? And we need to be able to have a community of folks that live, love, and learn together. Okay. We have time for uh, one more question. Lasso uh, Kamati, gracias. Thank you, Maestro, for, for coming out and sharing your wisdom, your knowledge with us. Uh, my question revolves around um, educators of color. I'm a high school teacher, Chicano, um, teaching in the South End, not too far from here in Tequila, um, in a very, very diverse uh, uh, community, like uber diverse. Um, my question is, uh, we've internalized a lot of stuff like a lot of pain, um, a lot of oppression, racism. And um, from your perspective, what, from your perspective, how, how can we deal with this to up our game? Um, I have uh, many colleagues who, um, you know, are, are just doing the same things, right? Sort of perpetuating the same systems that we find in K through 12 education. And, um, you know, I think, it, I think it's time that, 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 like I said, we up our game. You know, we start talking about liberatory practices, right, decolonization. And, um, you know, again, from your perspective, how, how can we deal with that, right? Yeah. Uh, I think that you are already on the right path, yeah, because first you are conscious that, one, you need to teach for liberation, not for oppression, yeah? And if you teach the same stuff that other people teach, you are ultimately reproducing the racial class gender order, yeah? So today we're talking mostly about race, but remember, liberation for one has to be full, and that includes dealing with intersectional domination. We're not just black and white, we're also workers, we're also uh, uh, women, yeah? We're gays and lesbians, so therefore we have to have this uh, multiple agenda, yeah? So I think that the job for the educator of color is to be, <laughs> Bob, uh, Bob Marley, yeah? Emancipate yourself from mental slavery. So we go to grad school and we are, te we are taught white logic, white methods, white everything, yeah? So I, I got a lot of that uh, in Wisconsin. I studied in Wisconsin, yeah? But I'm proud to tell you that then, as soon as I finished, and actually while I was studying, I was learning the tools of the master, but I was also developing my own, my own tools, yeah? I'm going to challenge uh, Audrey Lorde's theory about using the tools of the master to liberate myself. I don't need the tools of the master. I will use my own tools, yeah? I will develop my own tools for liberation, yeah? And I think that the, the, the educator of color and the progressive educator, white, et cetera, needs to work on this process of articulating possibilities, yeah, for change. But that change cannot come until you also change yourself. Now. I'm going to be realistic too. So you have to deal also with an internal order in your organization, yeah? That tells you that what you do, alternative critical stuff, is not as valuable as the mainstream stuff. But I think that you should be able to sleep tight every night, 
thinking and that you have been doing the right thing. So I became a, a PhD in sociology not to do <laughs> the job of you know ma maintaining a, a race, class, a gender order in place, but to subvert it, to challenge it. Yeah. So Karl Marx wrote in the 11th thesis on Feuerbach that philosophers have interpreted the world in various ways, and that the point is to change it. And for me, since I read that, I'm like, that's it. If I got my education just to maintain things as they are, I'm wasting my time. My job is to agitate, to educate. Agitate and educate. And to be part of a collective movement to improve the world. Thank you. By the way, those of you who could not ask questions today because of time, feel free to send me an email, and I'll do my best to answer your questions. Yeah, 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 yeah.